Our guest this weekend is Charles Hugh Smith, who operates the alternative financial website of twominds.com. And Charles recently wrote a brilliant article called The New Shackle of Serfdom Clinging to Healthcare Insurance. And so our topic this weekend is healthcare and the terrible state of healthcare services in America today. How did we ever reach a point where healthcare is so thoroughly anti market, so thoroughly captured by the regulatory state in DC and by their crony friends in the insurance industry? And how can we ever get back to a system of paying market prices for basic services and having insurance only for catastrophic injuries or illnesses? We'll explore these problems, and we'll also talk about some potential solutions that the marketplace offers, like minute clinics at places like Walmart and CVS, concierge care, which more and more doctors are interested in now offering, and medical tourism, which involves allowing people to purchase services outside the U.S. So if you're concerned about what's going on in the healthcare industry, stay tuned for a great interview with Charles Hugh Smith. Charles Hugh Smith, welcome so much for the first time to Mises Weekends. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Jeff. An article you ran on your site, Up Two Minds, about a week or so ago, um, also ran on LouRockwell.com, was entitled The New Shackle of Serfdom, Clinging to Healthcare Insurance. And I really enjoyed it because it, it talks about something I've always talked about, this ludicrous coupling of health insurance with one's employment, right? When you change jobs, you don't lose your auto insurance. You just pay the premium. Um, so let's unravel this a bit and talk about how we ever got into this mess where, first of all, we have health insurance to begin with, as opposed to paying cash for basic services, but also how it came to be part and parcel of one's job. So I'll open it up to you. Um, how did we ever get to such an anti-market healthcare system? <laughs> well, it's certainly um, a long and twisted road, as I understand it, Jeff, and I don't claim to be an expert in the history but as I understand it, um, it's a historical accident that um, healthcare insurance was linked to employment. And this, this came about back when employment was um, very stable, you know, the, the 40s and 50s when people would tend to work for a, a company for, for decades or perhaps their entire career. And, um, and healthcare insurance was actually more like hospitalization insurance. In other words, Back in the 50s, um, when um, uh, you know I was a child, um, my parents and everybody else paid for normal health care in cash. You know, the dentist paid in cash, doctor's visit paid in cash, so on. And so it was only hospitalization that, that it had insurance, and um, it was very low cost. And I know this because I found my father's paychecks from Sears, Roebuck and Company. <laughs> and and the, the hospitalization that he paid was a few dollars a week. And so um, it started out uh, looking rather benign. But as conditions changed, then we're stuck with this legacy system that makes no sense. Well, I've also read about during, especially during the World War II period, when there were actual wage controls in effect in the U.S., that employers got around that and attracted talent by giving them sort of a backdoor raise by offering a perk known as health insurance. Um, and of course, we also have this mess where, uh, in most cases anyway, um, health the provision of health insurance is deductible to an employer as a business expense, whereas it's not deductible, in most cases, to an individual as a personal expense. So it's definitely something that didn't happen by accident. In other words, it feels like the government has forced us into this insurance model we're in. Well, it certainly um, is enforcing a cartel structure that um, basically denies the market um, any chance to discover price. And, and that's why it, it, that's really the, the core, one of the core issues of why it's so devastating is uh, there's no real price discovery. So um, the pharmaceutical cartel, you know, puts a price that the um, insurance cartel um, pays. And then the hospital cartel takes care of, you know, their end. And so there's, we don't know what the price really is. We have no pricing mechanism. And imagine if, if we still had a system, as you alluded to, uh, from your own childhood, where our mom or dad, uh, when we're little, go in and pay cash for things. I mean, there, you would instantaneously have a huge amount of downward uh, pressure 
on prices for basic services. But what ever happened to this idea? Before Obamacare came along and mandated that all sorts of things be covered in even the most basic bare bones policy, you know, in my own youth time, um, as a young guy in the 80s, for instance, uh, all I had in terms of health insurance was a very high deductible catastrophic type policy. I think the deductible was $5,000 a year or something, which would have been a ton of money back then to me. Um, and all it covered was if uh, I got hit by a bus or I got cancer, you know, real hospitalization type things. And, and beyond that, I was young and healthy and I didn't care about health care insurance. Is this the kind of thing that we could ever get back to today? Well, Jeff, I think that's a great question. And I think that's we need to map out some route back to that, even to the 80s. And um, I, I can relate because I was an employer um, in the 80s. And I remember distinctly um, that all my uh, employees, I paid, I think, $54 a month, <laughs> you know, for, for, for basic health care coverage, which was a copay, you know, 80, 20 or something. And so it's like, where did we, how did we get from a situation that health care was once quasi affordable and, and provided a lot of, um, a spectrum of choices to now it's horrendously expensive, no matter what you choose. Um, and, um, as a self-employed person, I I, uh, I know that the, the cost is just horrendous. If you don't uh, qualify for a subsidy, that is, if you have a middle class or above income, then you're paying $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 a year for um, Obamacare, or if you're lucky, um, a grandfathered in equivalent. And, and that's insane. But since it's so expensive and since it's not deductible generally, to the individual, which means if they have a fifteen or eighteen thousand dollar annual premium for, let's say, their family policy, that means they got to make twenty five or thirty thousand dollars before tax, pre tax, to have that money. Um, you know, it's just it, you talk about the need in a capitalist society to have mobility of labor and capital, and I just wonder how many Americans who have entrepreneurial aspirations are scared to quit their job, right? Because they're afraid of being self-employed and having to go out and get health insurance on the market. They're afraid to leave that sort of cozy confine of employer-provided health insurance. I mean, it must be a huge drag uh, in the sense that people don't leave their jobs as readily. I think you're absolutely right, Jeff. I think it uh, completely suppresses self-employment and uh, the start of new businesses. Um, and it, it also suppresses um, hiring employees because if you do start a business and um, get it functioning to where it can cover you and your family, um, the huge cost of, of health care insurance puts a, a huge burden on, on hiring anybody else. And so it, it keeps very small businesses very small because it, it's a huge leap of faith to hire people and have to pay these um, ridiculous uh, health care premiums. So it suppresses self-employment, entrepreneurship, and hiring. That's a bad combination. <laughs> well, as you point out, if one happens to be poor, presumably there is Medicaid there as a backstop, or you simply go to the emergency room or whatever and default on the bills when they come. Um, and of course, there's also a workaround in the current system for wealthy folks. You know, someone like Barbara Streisand is not going to call her doctor and wait two weeks for an appointment. She can take advantage of something which is now termed concierge care. Maybe she pays $100,000 a year to a favored doctor, and that doctor serves a very small group of people who also pay him or her that 100000 and they can get same-day appointments. They have the doctor's cell phone number. They can call them 24-7. They can get prescription refills, uh, referrals, all these things very easily. It's like having a concierge as your doctor. Um, there's been some movement to move that down into more affordable middle class levels, like a $5,000 a year annual payment. But I wonder, I'd like to get your thoughts on, is this viable? I suspect if that became prevalent, the FedGov would come along and try to say, well, you can't do that, or you have to accept Medicare patients, for example, that they would find a way to keep that away from average folks. You know, Jeff, it's, um, you raise a, a, a critical point in this discussion, which is what the federal government and, um, and also by the state governments, how they enforce a system that is broken. And so when you try to do a workaround, you're always, you know, at least in the lower rungs of our economy, you're breaking the law. Like people write me and they say, 
that they know a lot of people who are just in the underground economy. You know, they fix cars, but they only do so for cash. So they get their Medicaid coverage, you know, paid by the, the government, but they're making money cash. And, and so um, that's another kind of bad thing that they, these ridiculous costs do is they push people who with marginal businesses into the underground economy where they pay no tax. And then, then, then they're, they're basically um, subsidized by um, those of us who are paying the tax. You know, I, I like the idea of, of um, more options, you know, and the concierge service is, is an option. And so, you know, that's part of what makes markets work is having a spectrum of choice, right? So that what works for one person might not work for somebody else, but there's another choice for them. And uh, so uh, there's another issue that I want to bring up, which is when the government mandates all these things like, no, you can't do that unless you provide Medicare, Medicaid, um, a lot of providers, and I mean doctors and uh, nurses and small clinics, they just decide to, to quit. They just, you know, they can't make money because, of course, the government, instead of, instead of breaking up all the cartels, which would be the way to lower costs, the government keeps the cartel structure, so all the prices are insane. You know, the, every medication is five or ten thousand dollars. Every hospital stays a hundred thousand dollars, and so on. Um, and so, what happens is, if the government imposes the cartel structure, then the only way it can reduce the costs is to reduce the payments to the providers at the front line. So that, that means, and I get complaints um, from, I'm, I'm hearing from doctors via email that, you know, they can't survive. They get like $31 for some um, Medicaid, Medicare um, procedure or visit or something. Um, so they're going to quit. And so then we're not going to have enough providers to provide health care. It's such a tough road to become a doctor. You know, you give up your 20s, you go into debt. Uh, you, you give up a lot of your health and all the stress involved. I mean, I, I fear for my own uh, senior years, who's going to be around to be doctors? It's not, it's not just a rhetorical question. But, you know, we talked about the workaround that the poor and the rich have to go get health care. But let's talk about some of the workarounds doctors have. One is one you just mentioned, dropping out. Um, two is perhaps trying to opt out, provide concierge care, go into research, uh, leave the country, et cetera. But there's a third one, which is, you know, there's some of these areas where there, it's still cash. And, and look at how these things have become better and cheaper over the years. Laser eye surgery is one example. It used to be done with a scalpel and it costs like $10,000. Now it's done with a laser. You see it, you see it advertised for like $1,000 because of course, insurance doesn't cover it. Um, there's also an analogy with plastic surgery, uh, you know, pe people go to the dermatologist or the plastic surgeon for cosmetic type treatments. And these have gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper uh, because of because supply and demand, at least to an extent, is allowed to operate. So I'd like your comments. Yes, Jeff, that that's exactly uh, correct, that when the market's allowed to function, um, where innovation is um, allowed to flourish and people are presented with um, the cash price. So there's competition. Um, then the cost of care plummets. And um, so obviously that's the, the, the solution that needs to be expanded. Um, and I think that uh, there is a movement uh, toward that. And a lot of people look at, um, I think Walmart has a $30, you know, flat fee service in some of their pharmacies. And, and there, there is movement both in corporate America and by individuals to offer uh, just cash services. And I know a lot of doctors would, um, would love that model or they're, they're trying to get to that model because they also can eliminate all the paperwork. Um, one, one fellow wrote me that he says he has like six people on his staff that do nothing but process paperwork to deal with all this government stuff. And so if you're paying cash, guess what? You know, you, you need one person. And so that, that's the whole cost of, of, of health care will go down the more we move to cash because we won't need 40 percent of the money now goes to processing paperwork and some other unknown percentage as high as 25 percent from what I've um, gathered is lost to um, uh, fraud and corruption. You know, in other words, people um, billing the government for services that weren't rendered. And so if we could eliminate the waste, 
in our system, we could drop uh, the cost of the system by over 50% right off the bat, never mind allowing innovation <laughs> and competition. Well, wouldn't it be beautiful if despite all the heavy handedness of the state here, that someone like a Walmart with its minute clinics or whatever they call them was able to cut through and at least apply some measure of market to this? In other words, what people really want is to be able to go see the doctor same day without an appointment. They want to pay a low amount, 30 bucks or something for, you know, your typical cold, flu, uh, earache, whatever it might be. So so we, we definitely need to keep an eye on that. But I wanted to get back to um, something you mentioned in your article, which is you've written in the past about this. Basically, there's two options that we might consider when we look at, at healthcare in Western countries and in the U.S. One is that we go back to what we had, which is basically a cash system with honest pricing, get the state out of it. Perhaps insurance exists, but only you know, high deductible catastrophic type insurance. Or the second option is we go you know, to the full UK or Canadian model where you literally have what I guess is now termed single payer. The government doctors provide you health care of a sort in these dreary clinics with long waits and there's, there's scarcity and there's limits on, on uh, certain kinds of surgeries and there's end of life uh, considerations when, when things get really expensive. All that sort of DMV, uh, VA model of health care provision. But, so those are the two basic models out there in the world today. Of course, the left hates the cash and capitalism model. Um, but here in the U.S., we're mired in this middle, this sort of corporatist model where we ostensibly have private medicine through this network of insurance payments and the, the state and Medicare determine how much is paid. So it seems to me, and I hate to say this as, a, as obviously a hardcore anti-statist, that ours is the worst. Our, our model is actually worse than the other two. In, in, a, in a twisted way, we might argue that 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 the Canadian or the UK system is better than what we've got. I mean, I know it isn't in terms of results because you can still opt out, I, like I said, if you're Barbara Streisand. But it, it seems like we have saddled ourselves with the worst of both worlds. I totally agree, Jeff. And I think that um, we can quantify that. It's not just an opinion. You know, healthcare in the U.S. costs far more than it does anywhere else in the world. And uh, the results are at least in terms of public health, like the, our problems with um, uh, obesity and, and uh, chronic disease and stuff, I don't think we're, we're, we're doing as well as other countries that spend a, a whole lot less money on whatever model. So, yeah, and, and you know, let's talk about that. What about if we had a, a uh, government-run, you know, service, like a, you know, gigantic VA or something that was available and that um, anybody could sign up for? But there was also an unfettered open market so that if, if you wanted uh, the government service, you could sign up and, and they'd, that would be paid for by taxes. But it would be, as you said, it would be slow, inefficient, there'd be limits on what you could get. But it would be like a way of covering, offering coverage to everybody, but in an unfettered market alternative, then there'd be this whole other spectrum. And I think that competition between these two systems would um, drive price and innovation because um, that's what um, that's what that's what the market excels at is introducing um, innovations that um, make things faster, better, cheaper, and allow people the choice based on the price and and the quality and the service and everything that should be transparent. And that's what's so wrong about our system is nothing's transparent. <laughs> the cost is is not transparent. And the quality of service isn't transparent. You don't even know what you're buying. Well, Charles, we only have time for one last question. Let's talk about what libertarians might do here and now today to, to make things better for themselves and for their families in terms of trying to go out and get health care. Um, one thing that pops to mind is this new burgeoning industry called medical tourism. Um, I witnessed this uh, quite a bit in the 80s and 90s when I lived in San Diego for many, many years. People would go to Tijuana. Um, for, for especially for dental treatments, root canals, et cetera, and pay uh, a much more affordable cash payment. Um, how can we go about working within or without the system as libertarians? Uh, any thoughts or suggestions? Uh, well, two things occur to me, Jeff. One is, um, as, as you say, medical tourism, and uh, it's th certainly thriving in uh, places like Thailand, 
where uh, my wife has gone for dental, uh, dental work and uh, skin care uh, at, at like a fraction of the cost in, in the U.S. And so um, and these are often U.S. trained or European trained doctors. And so the quality of care is, is quite high and it's also transparent in the States. Um, I think we need to try to support those doctors, nurses, and clinics which are offering cash services. So, and it's hard to find find them sometimes, you know. And so, um, the ideal uh, to me would be to establish like sort of a, a national network of providers of cash services, and so that if if there was a a site that everybody could go to to find cash providers in their area, then we'd start supporting those people who were um, providing that alternative system. Well, that, you know, that's a great idea. And I must say at the Mises Institute, we know lots of doctors who are doing this, even surgeons who are involved in groups that are, are cash friendly. So uh, it's definitely something we need to pursue. But Charles Hugh Smith, thank you so much for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to check him out, he has a great website called uptwominds.com. If you like alternative financial websites, Mises.org, Zero Hedge, etc., I guarantee you will like his site. He's a brilliant guy, and he really has a different way of looking at some of the things that are going on today. So I really encourage you to check out uptwominds.com. Charles Hugh Smith, thanks again, and ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. 